All right, I asked uh, John Wynn to forego introducing me because most of you know me from previous years at the conference, and those of you that don't know me have invariably walked up and said, are you Pamela Acker? So at this point, I feel like I require no introduction, so we'll just roll right into the talk because I'd actually like to do a little bit of a lab exercise with you today, and that's going to take um, uh, more time than an introduction, so we'll just get going. I'm going to talk primarily about the um, anti-scientific nature of evolution theory and its practical consequences in medicine and research. Now, John's talked about the Cartesian-Darwinian narrative. He's going to talk about the historical um, economic consequences. He's going to talk in more detail about some of the consequences in terms of um, the culture of death. I'm going to talk, my next talk is also about the culture of death. I'm going to do something slightly different from John. Um, but in this talk, I want to focus on the fact that Evolution is actually not only unscientific, it's anti-scientific. And what that does to our understanding of biological research and our application of biological research in the medical field. So I'm starting with the Oxford English Dictionary definition of science, which is a little bit different from the definition of science that you've seen from philosophical or Thomistic standpoints up to this point. But this is going to be our working definition because this is the secular definition of science as practiced in the laboratory, when people say they're following the science, this is generally what they're talking about. They're not talking about a Thomistic definition. So science is a noun, which means the intellectual and practical activity encompassing the systematic study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world through observation and experiment. Now, I've learned from many years of teaching high school and middle school and college that you can give a kid a definition, but if you don't show them what it means, it doesn't really help anything. So we're going to spend a little while showing you what this actually means, because I think this is really important. This is one of the most important lessons that I teach um, my high school science students to understand exactly what science is and how it works. And I call it the card trick, and there's some rules for playing. So this is why I asked everybody to have something to write on. So if you have something to write on, go ahead and pull that out. So for purposes of this demonstration, you may safely assume that your prior knowledge of the world applies. I have in my hand a deck of cards. It's not magical. There's nothing tricky about it. But you know some things about a deck of cards, right? This is usually where I call on my students and I make them list all the things that they know. So think for a second about the things that you know, because I might call on you. How many suits are in a deck of cards? Four suits. How many colors are in a deck of cards? What are they? Okay, what are the suits? Clubs, spades, <laughs> Everybody lists them in a different order, right? Clubs, spades, hearts, diamonds. Or, um, did I do that right? Yes, okay. Um, uh, how many numbers are in a deck of cards? Nine. Okay, there's one through nine, right? And then there's some face cards. Jacks, queens, kings, aces. Some people argue, quibble over whether aces are uh, the number one or a face card. And so for our purposes, we're going to assume that they are uh, face cards. Okay, so because sometimes you have to apply definitions because things are a little wonky. This is true even in biology. Are viruses alive? Well, it depends on who you ask, All right? So for our purposes, you may safely assume that the world, which in our case is a deck of cards, is something you know something about and you can apply that knowledge. I'm going to give you some data in a moment about this world, because this world has an inherent order. And when you look at the world around you, it also has inherent order. And the whole purpose of science is uncovering the order in the world. We wouldn't have laws of physics if this wasn't true, if we didn't live in an ordered universe. So this is a little bit artificial, but there's an order in this deck of cards, and you're going to make some predictions about the order in this deck of cards, which is an overly simplistic representation of the order in the natural world. Um, and those predictions have to be uh, based on your prior knowledge about the world. So can you make a very clear prediction about the order of this deck of cards without me showing you any of the cards? Most of you are shaking your heads, and you're correct, right? You have to actually collect some data before you can make a very good prediction, right? If your prediction, which is also known in scientific circles as a hypothesis, is invalidated by the data, that means if you're wrong, you must make a new one. And the last rule is you may not cry. My students always find this exercise very frustrating. And every single year when I teach, I make someone cry 
And I'd like to not do that today. So the last rule is you may not cry. All right, any questions about the rules? Because I'm about to give you some data. So everybody have something to write with or think about. All right, this is where I need your help, Hendrik, to be my feet. Um, and this is why I asked you to move closer because in a classroom, it's very easy to see a card of this size, but in this auditorium, it's a little bit difficult. So um, if you'd like to keep track of your data so that you can make a good hypotheses about the order in this deck of cards, you might want to write it down. And if you could, you're lucky enough to see, be able to see the bottom of this blackboard, you'll be able to actually follow along. Okay. So I'm going to start with two data points. Um, and the first card in my deck is a four of diamonds. The second card in my deck is a queen of clubs. All right, you have two data points. Make a prediction about the order of the cards in this deck. There, no, 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 no. Don't say it out loud, write it down, sorry. My instructions weren't entirely clear. I need to add another rule. Don't tell me your prediction, write it down. Because everybody in this room, I would like to make a prediction so that you can actually follow along with this process, okay? You can make some really easy predictions about the order in the stack of cards. Okay, can you put them on the board for me? Thank you. The four first, the queen second. Very good. Okay. Um, did anybody predict that the order in the deck is red, black, red, black, red, black, red, black? Okay, good. Your prediction is valid according to the amount of data that you have. Did anybody predict that we would have number, face, number, face, number, face? Your prediction is valid based on the data that you have. Did anybody predict that there would be one red card followed by all black cards? No, your prediction is also valid based on the data that you have. That prediction would also be valid, but you, you feel like you'd be, you'd be wrong, right? So let's, uh, let's hold up the next card and see how many of you are still right. We have a seven of hearts. Raise your hand if your prediction is still correct. Excellent. Okay, Henrik, can you help me out here? I'm sorry. You're not, you're not going to get to write. You're just going to have to move. Okay. All right. So those of you who predicted that the pattern is red, black, red, black, red, black, what are you predicting will come next? A black card. Those of you who predicted that we have number face, number face, number face, what are you predicting will come next? Only some of you will be right. Okay. Raise your hand if your hypothesis is still correct. Okay, if your hypothesis is still correct, you don't have to revise it. If it is incorrect, you must generate a new hypothesis. I'll give you a second to do that. Most of you are gonna switch over to number face, number face, number face, I know, I know, I know this. I'm going to be very generous with you guys because in the interest of time, I can't drag this out as long as I would in a classroom. And I'm going to give you four more data points. Is everybody ready? Everybody has a hypothesis. Okay. <clears throat> Your next four data points, and I'll walk for this one, are in order. A nine of, I should stand over here, right? Nine of spades, thank you, sir. An ace of clubs, a three of hearts, and a queen of diamonds. Are you still correct? Yep. Raise your hand if your hypothesis is still correct. <laughs> You're doing this in your head because you can't write right now, right? Okay. All right, all right. Ooh, yes, for our purposes, Ace is considered a face card. So, um, 
So Brandon asked, is, is the, are the cards in the deck random or realistic hypothesis? If I hypothesized that everything in the universe was random, could I do science? No. So there's something very important that I actually want to, to bring home in this little exercise, and that is that I can't actually take data, make a hypothesis, test that hypothesis, and draw some kind of conclusion unless I assume an underlying inherent order in the world. Because if there is no order in the world and if everything is just random, I can't really know anything about it. Because if, if the laws of gravity are random and I drop this pin, I don't know if it's going to stay suspended in midair, go up, go sideways, or go down, right? So I, you, you may not hypothesize that the order is random, although many of my students wanted to do this because then they would never be wrong. But they would in fact actually be wrong because there is an order to these cards. And the other important point that might come home later, so put a little bookmark here, is do you think the cards arrived at my house in this order? Somebody had to put an order here, didn't they? We'll come back to that later. Okay, I'm going to give you another data point. It's going to make you all cry. Your next card is a jack of diamonds, or jack of hearts. Raise your hand if your hypothesis is still correct. All right, now try again. Make a new one. Because there is order to these cards. And if you're looking closely, you might see something slightly more complex than you originally hypothesized. Um, so I just got asked, is there a value placed on the face cards? For our purposes, we're not assuming any value placed on the face cards. Because remember, I teach this to high school students, so it has to be as simple as possible. And I'm not making fun of high school students per se. It's just that the poor things have to do seven classes in the course of a day. And if I'd like them to remember what I teach them, it has to make sense. Yeah. Okay, now I am going to pick on some people. Who's got a hypothesis if it's the data? Jackie. Um, the, next three the next three are going to be three black. Anybody else agree with this? Okay. Anybody have a different hypothesis? Brother Kevin. Diamonds, and then two of the Okay, so we've got diamond, two of another suit, diamond, two of another suit. No, you're not right, Brother Kevin, because I've got a heart after that. All right. Oh, okay. All right. So, so Brother Kevin is hypothesizing that the diamonds are important, and in between all the diamonds come first one, and then two, and then three, and then four cards. So how many cards would you need for me to determine whether this is correct or not, Brother Kevin? <laughs> well, you just had, you had three, you had two and then three, so you'll need four for your next one, which means you need three plus one to see if we get, if the last card is a diamond. And if the last card is a diamond, your hypothesis is correct. Should we test this hypothesis? We can do that. All right, ready? Brandon, if you keep interrupting, I'm going to send you to the back of the class. <laughs> Can you come up and read? Okay, we have a jack of spades, a three of clubs, an ace of spades. Is Jackie still correct? So the next card will actually determine whether both Jackie and Brother Kevin are correct, if I'm correct, I'm counting correctly, right? So Brother Kevin predicts it will be a diamond, Jackie predicts it will be red. Oh, look at that. Look at that. Okay. Raise your hand if your hypothesis is still correct. Very good. Raise your hand if your hypothesis is incorrect. Anybody brave enough to say that? Oh, oh, oh some of you are brave enough to say that. Look at that. That's the advantage of teaching adults. I have a quick question. Yes. Would a hypothesis to say that it would not be a the following card would not be a uh, would it have been a valid hypothesis to say that none of the following cards would be a four or a queen? It would be, but it would not be particularly helpful to determining the actual order in the universe. So, 
Right. So you're basing your knowledge on the fact that there are a limited number of fours and a limited number of queens. Okay. I'm going to stop there because I think I've made all of the points that I need to make. Right. One of them is that there is inherent order in the universe. In order to do science, I have to assume that. Another is that um, often I can come up with a very simplistic hypothesis for the data set that I have, but as I generate more data, I have to refine my hypothesis. Don't I? Many of you, and did, no one was correct for their first hypothesis, were you? Okay. Another important point, do you see that um, jack of hearts there in the middle of the queen of, of uh, diamonds and the jack of spades? All right. Everyone was predicting that there should be a number card there, weren't they? Because they were everybody defaulted to the number face, number face, number face hypothesis. Does that one data point, because if you look at everything else, it's still number face, number face, number face, number face, except for that one jack. Does that actually invalidate your hypothesis? Well, that depends on how you do your statistical analysis, which depends on how many data points you have and depends on how much of a math magician you are, which Hendrik would be probably better at than me. OK. All right, so you may relax off the hot seat. I'm going to talk for a little bit. Thank you all for your participation. OK. So the scientific method, um, yes, I'm done with the word. The scientific method is, uh, you know, if you look up any list of steps in the scientific method, you'll come up with something slightly different from this variation. This is my preferred variation that I would teach to my students. Um, in order to do science, you have to make an observation about the world. You have to do some background research about the world. So we, we did that with our, our deck of cards. You knew what was in the deck of cards. You have to make a prediction about what those observations mean. You have to test that prediction. So your prediction has to be testable. If you have a hypothesis that is not testable, that's not science. That's scientific opinion. Once you test your hypothesis, you have to analyze your results. And as many of you learned today, usually then you have to start all over. So that's how you do science. Science involves a lot of inductive reasoning. Um, in the laboratory, you're going to gather data particulars about uh, whatever you're studying, and you're going to use that to make theories and models um, and, and come up with universal principles. Okay? So the theory of evolution is considered kind of a universal principle in biology. Um, just about everything has to bow to it. If you read any articles that are written in any scientific journal anywhere, they're going to reference evolution in some way, shape, or form. And if you look at any textbook that is taught to any student in any secular or Catholic institution, they're going to uh, refer everything back to evolution. I taught AP biology for four years, and I took two of the tests and, and just kind of coded every question based on the topic that they were asking about. So, you know, was this question directly about evolution? Was it about meiosis? Was it about genetics? Was it about, you know, population biology? What, what, what was this question about? Over a quarter of the questions in both the tests that I scored were entirely about evolution. AP Biology is supposed to be a year-long class that replaces a freshman biology college course, and over a quarter of what they are tested on every year is strictly evolution theory. No genetics. Well, there is some genetics, but... You know, there is basic things about cell biology that would be far more helpful to know if you actually want to go on to be a biologist. Those things aren't on the test. But you'd better know your evolution theory, or you're going to fail. You are going to fail that test. Okay. So my question that I want to answer in this talk is, are, is the particular data that we've gathered sufficient to support the universal principle that we've been sold. I um, give you a hint. My answer is very short, and it's two letters. <laughs> OK. Um, so in order to come up with a general principle from a particular set of data, we have to do a little bit of extrapolation. And extrapolation is not entirely inappropriate. When you have a sufficient n value, that means just the total number of things that you're doing an experiment on, you can make a conclusion. So for example, if you're testing the efficacy of a vaccine and you inject it into 40,000 people and your 95% uh, efficacy rating is based on 140 of those individuals, 
Your n value is too small. Your extrapolation is inappropriate. Okay. You also have to take into account whether the variables that you're testing are sufficiently representative of real conditions. I can take things, put them into the laboratory in completely artificial conditions and come up with very, very strange conclusions. Okay. There was some very famous experiments that were done on rats. If you put a rat in a cage and you gave them uh, a button that they could press for food and a button that they could press for drugs, they would press the button for the drugs until they overdosed themselves and died. So there were a lot of um, conclusions that were drawn about addiction based on these experiments. Well, someone else went back and said, well, you put the rat by itself in a cage with nothing to do. What if we put a bunch of rats in the cage and we gave them mazes to climb on and toys to play with and things to chew on and other rats to pal around with? Would they overdose themselves on drugs? Guess what they didn't do? They didn't overdose themselves on the drugs. The drug isn't actually more appealing than the food unless you're bored and have nothing to do. Okay, so you have to make sure that what you're testing is actually representative of real conditions. And then you also have to make sure that the extrapolation is proportionate to the data. And you guys saw this in our little experiment. You had two data points and you made a prediction which didn't hold, right? If I have a very small amount of data and I'm making a very large extrapolation, there's only two places in science where this is acceptable, cosmology and evolution theory. Anyway, I sat through, many of you don't know, uh, despite the fact that I'm famous, um, that I, I worked uh, for Pfizer as, a, as an intern at one point. So um, I actually wanted to develop genetic vaccines and did work in vaccine development, many of you know that. Um, but I also worked at the NIH not directly for the NIH, but when I was at Catholic U, I would travel up to the NIH for a number of the different um, things that we were doing. We didn't have certain equipment that we, we used in collaboration with the lab there. And then when I switched over to working on um, genetics of development in a little worm, which I'll talk about later, we would go up for the uh, twice monthly worm meeting. Yes, they did call it that where all of the worm scientists would get together and talk about their experiments on worms. And I have watched people get into heated arguments that I was afraid would come to blows over inappropriate extrapolations of massive data sets. Because in real science, you need a lot of data to make a small theory instead of a small amount of data to make a theory that explains everything. Okay. I, I can't not talk about my favorite and inappropriate extrapolation because God bless Ken Miller. May the Lord make him happy in this life and the next. But he says some really dumb things. And one of the really dumb things he said at, uh, in, in court, actually, was that we have a, a transitional sequence that has no missing links. See all you creationists, we've got a perfect transitional sequence. By the way, he only had one. He should have a lot more than that, but that's okay. We'll grant him that he had a sequence. But in the middle of his sequence was a beast called Rhodocetus. And you can see the artist rendering of Rhodocetus on the screen. You can see the actual skeleton. The actual skeleton that they found consisted of a skull, um, part of the pelvis, a few vertebrae, and one leg bone. And the artist decided that this animal had webbed feet. And the original artist rendering actually also had a fluked tail. That is an inappropriate extrapolation based on the data that I have. I cannot conclude that this animal has webbed feet or a fluked tail. I can't conclude anything about its tail based on the few vertebrae that I actually have. <clears throat> so um, I'm gonna ask you to participate a little bit again, but you don't have to volunteer your answers. Um, when evolution is used as a framework for research, we would expect some certain things to be true, right? we would be able to make certain predictions. So if mutations are the mechanism of evolution, we would expect to see certain things when we're looking at mutations. If all living creatures evolved from a common ancestor, we would expect to see certain things that would indicate that all living creatures share common ancestry. And if man evolved from monkeys, we would expect to see certain things about man and monkeys that would clearly show that we were closely related. So I won't ask you to fill in the blank on all of my empty sentences up there and make your own predictions about what you expect to see. But I'll walk you through a few things that we would expect to see 
And I'm going to give you the short answer about whether we see them or not. It's also a two-letter word. If mutations are the mechanism of evolution, we would expect that mutating an organism to the nth degree would show us in the laboratory other kinds of organisms, especially if we take an organism that has a really short generation time, like a fruit fly, it's 10 to 12 days, right? The first mutated fruit fly was discovered in 1910 by Thomas Hunt Morgan, 112 years ago. Assuming the longer generation time of 12 days, that's about 3,406 generations of mutated fruit flies. I still haven't produced anything other than a funny-looking fruit fly by speeding up the process that's supposed to give me new kinds of organisms for 3,406 generations. Bacteria is even worse, because bacteria in the laboratory has a generation time of 20 minutes. I, I didn't bother to do that math, because the number that would have resulted in terms of generation times is astronomical, and we can't really comprehend it anyway. <laughs> It's got too many zeros behind it. But we've been mutating bacteria for almost as long as we've been mutating fruit flies and speeding up the rate of mutation. And if mutations were actually going to give us new forms of animals or new animals that were on the way, at least new animals that were on the way to new forms of animals, we should have seen something by now. If mutations are the mechanism of, of evolution, we would expect to see that mutations build up information in the genome, but that's not what we see. Every mutation that is supposedly beneficial that I have ever studied in the last seven or eight years has actually been the result of the breakdown of specificity in a molecular component. Okay, and if you've ever done photocopying, you know that you can't add information to your photocopied uh, piece of paper by photocopying something that's fuzzier and fuzzier and fuzzier and fuzzier. It doesn't work. Okay, so when a protein lose specif loses specificity, it's like that photocopy losing clarity, right? It gets harder and harder and harder to tell what specifically it's supposed to be or specifically it's supposed to do, right? Um, and just for a specific example, I like to talk about MRSA because everybody knows of MRSA because MRSA is actually a pretty dangerous thing if you get an infection in the hospital, right? Because it's antibiotic resistant and there's, it's hard to clear out um, in that environment, which is saturated with antibiotics. Bacteria have, um, some bacteria, MRSA included, have um, peptidoglycan in their cell wall, which makes cross linkages. So you can sort of think of it as, you know, um, uh, beams in their, this, their molecular structure, right? And if I um, attach my beams at 90 degree angles, it's going to be a lot stronger than if I attach them at wonky angles, right? So the mutation that caused, well, sorry, back up for just a second. The antibiotic that usually will destroy the non-resistant Staphylococcus aureus interu interrupts that junction between the peptidoglycan. So it causes that junction to break, that causes the cell wall to dissolve, that causes the bacteria to die. And you're good to go because you no longer have a staph infection. Right? In MRSA, the connections are wonky. So the antibiotic no longer will bind at that connection, so it will no longer disrupt the cell wall. So if you have MRSA and you take an antibiotic, you're not good because that will stay the way that it is. But is this stronger than this? So what if I take some normal Staphylococcus aureus and I put it together with the MRSA in a test tube? The bacteria with the normal cell wall, the non-resistant bacteria, will rapidly outcompete the resistant bacteria. So the best way to get rid of a MRSA infection, and I'm not a doctor, so don't quote me on this, might be to get out of the hospital and go play in the dirt and get some real staff to outcompete your antibiotic-resistant staff. And again, in a life-threatening situation, please don't take that as medical advice. <laughs> All right, but in the laboratory, this does work. The, the non-resistant bacteria is better than the resistant bacteria unless it's in the presence of the antibiotic. So did I really get some information build up? Is that really beneficial? I could give a whole talk on this. I have before. It's probably on YouTube. So if you're really interested, go look it up.
right? If mutations are the mechanism of evolution, we should expect to see lots of room for mutation in the genome, but we don't. The junk DNA hypothesis has been it, it, garbage canned over and over and over and over again. There's so much evidence that indicates that, that there's no room for mutation in the genome, that any mutation, even slightly deleterious ones, even in areas that aren't genes or aren't coding for genes or aren't coding for even turning on and off of genes, is, is problematic. And I actually saw this in the laboratory research I did with the worms at Catholic University of America. There's a mutation in a segment of, of uh, the DNA called an intron. So most people know that genes are important, right? Genes kind of determine your physical makeup. A gene codes for a protein, but the gene in, in, in your DNA, in your chromosomes, it's kind of long. It's got segments that actually code for the protein. And in between, it's got segments that don't code for anything. Those are called introns because they come in between things that code for things, which are called exons. So when that gene is active in your body, the whole thing gets copied. And then there's a protein that comes along. It cuts the introns out. Okay. And then you make your protein. So one might conclude from that, well, if I'm cutting the introns out, they're not important, right? Well, the lab that I was working in discovered a mutation in one of those unimportant pieces of DNA. And it's one, it was a, a single mutation, and it caused the massively uh, altered phenotype of the worms being unable to lay their eggs and unable to defecate. This is a problem. Um, because you won't live a very happy life that way. <laughs> um, and it, 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 it's, um, the worms are actually also hermaphrodites, so they fertilize their own eggs. So the eggs actually develop is, as tiny worms inside the body of these mutated worms, and eventually it, it, the, the mother worm, if you can call it a mother, will burst open and all the baby worms will crawl out on their happy way and then go about their life cycle. So it, it, this is a dramatic life-altering event based on a single mutation in an unimportant piece of DNA, okay? So I can make changes in the genome, but generally speaking, they have really negative effects, even if they're not in places that we think are important. So there's not really room for enough mutations to accumulate, even over millions of years, to make a worm into a worm researcher. It just doesn't work that way. All right, so if all living creatures evolved from a common ancestor, we would expect to see that there are transitional forms all over the fossil record, but we don't. And even good Dr. Miller's supposedly complete transitional sequences are sadly inadequate. And I could go on and on and on about that, but that's also on YouTube, so I'll just let you look it up. If all living creatures evolved from a common ancestor, we'd expect that similar developmental programs would be controlled by similar genes, but they're not. And similar structures aren't even built by the same methods. So there are many animals that have uh, uh, digits in their, their hands, much like our fingers. They have similar joint structure. Um, some organisms that have digits in their fingers start with a nub and they grow the digits out. Some start with a web and the tissue is eaten back in between. So if all of these similar structures came from a common ancestor, why don't they develop in the same way? Why do we have dramatically different methods of development? That doesn't make sense. I'm actually going to skip this slide. It's one of my favorite, but I think I'm running out of time. It's also in all my other presentations, so you can look that one up on YouTube too. Okay. If man evolved from monkeys, we would expect to see chromosome similarities between monkey and man, but we don't, especially in the Y chromosome. The chimp Y chromosome is half the size of the human Y chromosome, and that half is only about 70% 70 per, 70 similar to the human Y chromosome. And the researchers that reported this finding said that this is the similarity they would expect to see between humans and birds, not between humans and their closest living relative, quote unquote. So how does evolution theory explain that? They can't. And when you couple that with the fact that every human being in the world, every male human being, because only men have Y chromosomes, is only at most 500 mutations removed from the consensus sequence of the original human Y chromosome. And those 500 mutations require at most 10,000 years to accumulate. 
I can't have the kind of mutation that makes a monkey into a man at the same time that I have the kind of mutation that makes every human Y chromosome that similar. Those two rates can't possibly be true at the same time. If man evolved from monkeys, we'd expect to see lots of transitional forms. John is going to talk loads about this later. But I love this image because this image is um, slides. It, it, this image is skulls that whenever I put in front of my students and I say, can you find the skull that's the Homo erectus skull, which is supposedly the, the one of the human ancestors. And they'll, they'll point to usually the middle one, maybe the, the one on the end. And then I say, well, sorry guys, that was a trick question. They're all Homo erectus skulls. These skulls were all dug up. They were all labeled as the same species, Homo erectus, um, from a site in Georgia. This uh, research was published in Science. If there's that much variation within the species, what business do we have doing digging up a skull saying this looks somewhat primitive and monkey-like, therefore it's a human ancestor? You know, and again, John is going to talk a lot more about this in his Fall of Darwin's Last Icon talk. Um, evolution leads to bad science. So every time I put this graphic up, people twitch a little because they're like, what does this even mean? Um, but if you look at the top part, I've represented a genome, well, the person who put this graphic together has represented a genome as a colored bar. So they've, they've kind of done a, a shading of colors across so you can tell that the bar starts with the blue and it ends with the green. When you do genome sequencing, and I worked at the Genome Sequencing Center at Washington University, which was one of the research things I forgot to mention in my little bio earlier, um, you cut up all the genetic information in an organism into little pieces, which is the second step. And you can see all the colors are out of order because you know when I cut things up into little pieces on moss, I, I don't have the correct order. And then you get some computer programmers to take the sequences of all those little pieces and start lining them up. And that's the third step that you see there where you start to see clusters of the colors coming together. So they, they map the things that overlap and they say they put, they put them together and come up with a sequence. And at the end, you have a sequence, and you'll notice there's some gaps in that sequence because there are gaps when you get finished sequencing something because there's a lot of repetitive DNA, and there's a lot of places it's not clear you know, what exactly comes in there. And the original human genome sequencing project came up with a figure of 3 billion base pairs for the human, human genome. And a few years ago, they did some additional sequencing on additional populations and figured out that there's actually 3.5 billion base pairs. So they missed a seventh of the genome the first time. So this is a hard, hard, hard thing to do. It's extremely labor intensive. It's time, uh, time intensive. It's money intensive. So because secular scientists believe that evolution is true, instead of actually doing this process with the chimpanzee joint genome, they took the already sequenced human genome and they lined up the little segments against that. They made a massive assumption and you know what happens when you assume? You become an evolutionist. Because only an evolutionist could take a man and turn it into an ass. Right, this was bad, bad, bad science. Um, and secular scientists have even realized this because they've had to take the chimpanzee genome that they sequenced, sequenced by lining it up with the human genome and scrap it. They've had to go back, do that really time-consuming process, process, and do the research all over again, completely all over again, because they realized that they were getting really bad results. And it turns out that the chimpanzee genome is, um, you've all heard the claim that we're like 98% chimp, right? Okay. We're only probably at most 83% similar to chimps. And when you think about the fact that it's a 17% difference in 3.5 billion base pairs, if you typed all of that information out using one letter for one position in the genome, you would end up with more pages of text than Dr. Syngenis has written in his entire life. So is evolution a suitable framework for research? Well, I can have all the theory in the world, but one real observation outweighs that. And I've just given you a smattering of a number of observations that show you that the theory doesn't quite hold water. 
So I would say it is not a suitable framework for research. Is evolution a suitable framework for medicine? Well, if I have an evolutionary framework for medicine, I'm going to do a number of things, and I've put them all on the board. I'm sorry, this is more text than I usually put on a single slide, but here we go. Um, the damage that evolution has done to research seems kind of abstract and distant to us because none of you have ever worked in a lab with worms that explode uh, while giving birth. <laughs> All right, that's a little bit removed from your everyday life. Um, whether bacteria have mutations in them or not is, again, a little bit removed from your everyday life unless you've had an infection with MRSA, right? But the way that this research is done and the framework behind it affects something that is near and dear to everyone's heart because everybody in here has been to the doctor. And if the way that your doctor does medicine is based on the way that evolution says that you came about, your doctor's going to do medicine very, very differently than if he thinks that you were created as a whole, a complete whole, by God, and that whole was then damaged by the fall, right? So I talked last year a lot about what a more um, Catholic and, and creation-based medical pro paradigm would look like. I'm going to talk this year a little bit about why evolution is such a bad framework for medicine, the damage that it's done. Um, so we can remember why that's important. Right, so when I use evolution as a framework for anything, I actually have to deny formal and final causality. And thanks be to God, Dr. Cletus did a much better job of explaining all of that than I was prepared to do. So I'm just going to reiterate briefly. Um, the formal cause of a living thing is its soul. Evolution can't explain, you can't, it, hypothesize how a soul could have evolved. Um, atheistic materialistic evolution removes the soul entirely because you can't take it out of a living thing, put it on a scale and weigh it and measure it and tell, it, tell somebody what it looks like and smells like and tastes like and how many grams it is. Um, so they ignore it entirely, right? But your, your body is animated by your soul and you die when your soul leaves your body and then you become a decomposing corpse rather than a man, right? So if I'm treating a living, living human being, I'd probably better be aware of the fact that he has a soul and that this is going to affect how his body is, is working at any given moment, right? It also denies final causality, so nothing is for a purpose, right? Even though I have to assume an inherent order in the universe, evolution requires me to assume that there, that inherent order arose through a lack of order through chaos, through randomness, through chance. So there can't be any purpose to anything, which means that I don't need to look at a human body and determine all of the individual parts, what purposes they have before I start cutting somebody open and removing things. Because nothing has a purpose. We evolved by the loss of organs that were not being used from our previous ancestors. So something appears to not being used, being used in the body. I don't look for a purpose for it. I just take it out. And I'll show you some examples of that in a minute. Evolution also assumes that the body is like a machine and you can, you can alter an individual part without really affecting the whole, right? Because that's how evolution has to work because I can't evolve from a chimpanzee to a man in one step. I can't evolve from a land animal to a whale in one step. It has to be through a gradual series of accumulated steps, which means that I can I'm assuming that I can change a part of an individual without affecting the whole that much. So I can alter any kind, any given individual part of you without, you know, causing death necessarily. And obviously some, you know, for distinction purposes, if anybody scientific listens to this at any point, you know, there, there are mutations that are fatal. So I'm not talking about those things. I'm talking about the ones that are actually supposed to be moving things forward. You still have to assume you can change a part without affecting the whole. You also assume that the body is just, a bunch of leftover parts from evolutionary ancestors, some of which aren't necessary anymore. And your framework is pretty grounded in, in enlightenment thought. And again, John's done a much better job of explaining exactly what that is and how that works. But you end up with a very prideful position of thinking that, it, which is also a very self-contradictory position. Your brain, which has evolved from pond scum, 
is somehow more intelligent than the body that evolved along with it. And you can go in and fix all the mistakes. So you're assuming that your intellect is more powerful than what created you, which is a violation of some first principles in philosophy. Something can't give what it doesn't have. Um, I can't make something greater than I am. So not, the pond scum couldn't have made an intellect that was sufficient to correct the errors of the pond scum. It's just not possible. But enlightenment thought is, is rooted in this idea that man's intellect is, is kind of the be all and the end all of everything. And so if I think I can go into the body, tinker around in a little bit, remove some parts, change some things, um, then I'm going to do that rather than actually sitting back as a humble student of, of the most amazing material work of God, right? We can't see the angels, but we can see ourselves. And, and we are truly the crown of material creation. And, and we should approach a human body with a great deal of humility because it was made, it's the masterpiece of a designer that's much, much, much greater than us. Okay, so in, in all of this, you get this underlying desire to transform human nature because of course we're always constantly evolving, right? To transform in human nature and make it better. And I would argue that this is what's influencing medicine right now. And this is why we're in some of the really dire situations that we're in with uh, current medical practices and probably also why I can't walk. So it's personal. Okay, so we've got some brilliant examples of the blindness of evolution-based medicine. Um, I'll talk a little bit about tonsillectomies and appendectomies, which is the whole idea that you can remove a part and won't affect the whole. I'm going to talk about really poor therapies that are based on evolutionary thinking. I'm going to include vaccination because many of you know me as a, the, vac the vaccine researcher or expert, quote unquote. All right, I'm going to talk a little bit about GMOs. I'm going to talk a little bit about the process of discovering drugs. I'm going to talk a little bit about animal research, and I'm going to talk a little bit about abortion. Okay, this is um, going to be a collection of postage stamps, not an academic paper. <laughs> So um, I, I would like to point out that the amount of research that went into coming to these conclusions is much, much, much greater than the, the snippets I'm going to be able to give you today because I want to give you something that is, is accessible and hang on toable. If you're interested in my source list, please ask me later. All right, so evolution assumed that a lot of organs are left over from our ancestors and, and these things sort of fall into disuse and eventually get eliminated from the body. These organs were termed vestigial and a vestigial organ um, was assumed to not have any proper function in the human body. There was uh, at the, the original Scopes monkey trial, there, they claimed a ridiculous number of vestigial organs in the human body. Basically, the human was a walking museum of evolutionary relics. And I'm just going to look at two of them Right now, I'm going to look at the tonsils and the appendix. And if you, if you put your fingers right here, you can feel some lymph nodes, but your tonsils are basically back there. And if they're swollen, you might want to take some vitamin C. <laughs> Again, I'm not a doctor. Don't quote me on that. But um, they are actually not non-functional organs. They're very important organs that are a part of your immune system. And this was overlooked for many, many, many years because the evolutionary biologists looked at the tonsils, said, we don't know what that's for. We don't need to know what that's for because clearly it's a vestigial organ. Um, so they just started removing them from people. Now, think about the way that you usually get sick. If I get sick, most pathogens come into my body through my mouth and my nose, right? My mouth and my nose both shuttle past my tonsils. Okay. If you take someone's tonsils out, you have removed the first line of defense of their immune cells because those tonsils are, are places where immune cells congregate and sample what's coming in from the environment. And that's your first early warning that you might be infected with a virus or a bacteria through the oral route. Right? Um, there's some evidence to back up that removing tonsils is not great um, during the polio epidemics. Patients who had their tonsils removed were way more likely to develop bulbar polio, the paralytic kind, than patients who had not had their tonsils removed. Um, they studied some cohorts of patients 30 years later, tried to match them across all kinds of other variables. 
you know, in terms of age and weights and lifestyle. And of course, this is a little hard to do. Um, but it turned out that those who kept their tonsils were generally healthier 30 years later than those who did not keep their tonsils. Um, and people started to realize, hey, this is an important part of your immune system. You know, in some cases, the tonsils still get enlarged or block airways, in which case you should remove them if they're blocking the airway. Obviously, suffocation is not a great way to go. Um, but you shouldn't remove them just because a kid has repeated infections. If a kid has repeated infections and repeated strep throat and things like that, the problem is not the tonsils. The problem is something else. Generally, something in the kid's environment. And it could be a diet problem. It could be an exercise problem. It could be a genetic problem. But it's not the fault of the tonsils. The tonsils are doing their job. The appendix was also uh, long thought of as a vestigial organ. Again, if your appendix ruptur ruptures, you should have it removed. That's dangerous. All right? But surgically removing the appendix just for the sake of removing it is not really a great idea. This one doesn't get done as much because you don't see, um, it, you can't see your appendix. Uh, it's way down at the bottom of your digestive system. So you can see your tonsils. You can see them swell up really bad when, when, you're, when you're sick. Um, but the appendix is actually part of your gut-associated lymphoid tissue. And, you know, again, most things are coming in orally. Most pathogens pass through your gut. So your gut-associated lymphoid tissue is very important. Your immune system plays a really important role in the formation of your, or, I'm sorry, your um, appendix plays a really important role in the formation of your immune system prior to the age of two in particular, and it plays a role in regulating your microbiome throughout your life. So many of you who have any familiarity at all with alternative health know that there's a lot of talk about diet and what diet does to the microbes that live in your gut. And when the microbes that live in your gut are not doing well, you're not doing well because your digestion isn't working properly. And a lot of problems, it can be related to lack of, of nutrition when you, you're trying to digest things. So the appendix is actually quite important, but it was one of those vestigial organs that was supposed to be left over. And again, we're not looking at causes of, you know, why does the appendix get inflamed? Why does it rupture? What can we do to change that um, so much? Because people were just removing it thinking it wasn't important. It was just a, a leftover appendage from when monkeys ate more uh, uh, cellulose than, than humans did, right? There are a number of therapies that have been implemented because uh, of evolution that are, I mean, honestly, quite laughable. Um, if you put your hands in the small of your back, you will notice there's a curve of your spine right there. Gorillas don't have this curve. Uh, monkeys don't have this curve. Chimps don't have this curve. So the, the, our supposed closest ancestors have a spine that goes like this. We have a spine that goes like this. Okay, slightly different, right? And there was a theory for a while that something got out of whack with our spine when we started walking upright, <laughs> all right? <laughs> so, you know, the way to fix back problems is to get rid of that bend in the spine at the bottom, okay? Now, anybody who has sat in front of a computer for hours in a chair without lumbar support knows this is a bad idea. Okay, the way to give yourself back problems is to get rid of that curve in your spine because the way the curve in your spine is, you know, yes, you can have some problems with, with um, slipping of discs and things like that. If, you're, if your um, core, uh, you know, muscular structure is kind of limp and weak, like uh, mine is. Um, but the way that that curve is shaped is actually ideal for distributing forces in your body when you're walking. It's actually ideal for upright walking. It's not some evolutionary mistake that we need to correct. And when you try to correct it, you actually end up usually worsening people's back problems rather than fixing their back problems. Again, I have unfortunate personal experience of lack of ability to correct back problems. Um, we also think we need to correct the human immune system. And Bradford talked yesterday, day before, Monday, all my days are running together, about the iconography that's used with evolution. So I don't think it's a coincidence that this particular icon of vaccination looks like a deliberate mockery of a nativity scene. This is a mural in Detroit that was painted in the 1930s. And if anybody wants to know what vaccination is really about, this image sums it up pretty well, I think. So 
we think we can correct the human immune system, fix the things that are wrong with it, so that it, it, doesn't, it doesn't cause us to die. And this is based on bad science. Remember what I said about in, the in value previously? All right, you need a large in value to make a, a large extrapolation. Um, Edward Jenner, who's credited with the invention of vaccination, had an in value of two. But he only challenged one of the patients he originally inoculated with the cowpox, with smallpox. So really, he had an end value of two and he only tested half of his sample. And the, sam the half that he tested was the neighbor boy, not his own son. So, um, so he purposely exposed him to smallpox and the neighbor boy didn't develop symptoms. Um, now, there's a lot of things that can go into this and this could be a whole talk in, in and of itself, but you know, the timing of that exposure, the, the fact that they weren't aware of subclinical infections, um, the fact that it's not recorded whether James Phipps was ever, you know, diagnosed with smallpox before or not, it, there's, a, there's a number of things that, that don't come into play here that could potentially invalidate his in value of one. But this is what we've based an entire medical paradigm on. And you're not allowed to question it, right? So what most people also don't know is that by 1815, both boys were dead from tuberculosis, and you can actually pass tuberculosis by arm-to-arm -arm inoculation, which is how they inoculated the two boys with cowpox. So um, once they started using Jenner's method of vaccination, um, you started passing diseases around quite a bit. Infants started dying of syphilis and things like that. Um, I have a lot more I could say on vaccines, and I actually have a couple slides on that, but I'm going to skip them in the interest of not making us late for lunch because that's important. Also, almost everything I've said on these slides is in other talks that you can access elsewhere. Okay, um, some of you have heard of CRISPR. Um, CRISPR is a very complicated thing to explain in a very short talk, but basically it's a molecule that was discovered that can cut and paste DNA. So um, you can think of it as genetic scissors. So you can go into the genome in a particular place, make a cut, and put something new in there. So there's two things you can do with this. You can, you can cut out damaged genes. So say you have a gene that's inclining you to um, produce proteins that are really bad for you. Uh, you can remove that gene, hypothetically. Um, and if you have a gene that you want to put in the genome, you can hypothetically insert that gene. And I had a kid come running into the classroom about seven years ago going, Miss Hacker, Miss Hacker, this is amazing. Like, this is going to change everything. There's going to be designer babies. I know you're going to be annoyed about it, but it's great. And I said, I just looked at him and I said, it'll never work. Guess who was right? Um, researchers at the European Molecular Biology Laboratory in Heidelberg, Germany, used CRISPR to make cuts in 136 different genes. In about a third of cases, proteins were still produced from these quote, damaged genes. And furthermore, many of the proteins remain partially functional. So at least a third of the time, if I'm trying to cut out a gene, I fail. In studies of mice and human cells, Bradley's team has found that around a fifth of the cells, CRISPR causes deletions or rearrangements more than 100 DNA letters long. These surprising changes are sometimes thousands of letters long. So I'm not cutting out the things I'm supposed to be cutting out. I'm also cutting out other stuff. Now, I don't know about you, but if a toddler took some scissors to my copy of the complete works of Shakespeare, I don't think they'd be improving it. And unfortunately, CRISPR was actually tested on some babies a few years ago in China. Um, and they found in that trial that there was inefficient genetic editing, that these kids are now mosaics. Some of their cells are altered and some of them are not. Um, the CRISPR made unintended cuts in the genome, and there's no way to truly predict the off-target edits in the mosaicism, and there will always be shortcomings in this area. But this whole phenomenon is based on the idea that if everything has the same genetic code, I can alter the genetic code of a human being and it'll be totally okay. I'm just doing what evolution does, but I'm doing it intelligently. That's the thinking. <laughs> Right, drug discovery. Um, someone's trying to tell me it's time for my talk to be over. Um, <laughs> drug discovery um, is, uh, is also, it, it's based on this idea, but on a molecular level of I can modify a part 
and it won't really affect the whole, or I don't need to understand exactly how it's going to affect the whole. Because again, this is how evolution works, right? I have a little change in a little protein and it's no big deal. And then I get a little, another little change and another little change and eventually it all gets better. And I make, you know, a um, microbiologist out of a microbe, but that's not really how it works. And unfortunately, drug discovery focuses on a single molecular target and um, they test that the a candidate drug on that particular molecular target in a test tube. And then if it works, they take it on to the next phase and eventually can produce it in man. So pharmaceutical companies think that cellular processes look like this, right? You've got a drug, which is in the yellow, and it comes in and binds to the specific target that they're that they're wanting to to it to bind to, and then it does its little thing in the cell and it produces its results and you have therapeutic effects. But this is what cellular processes actually look like. Okay, this is the massive cascade involved in one protein and what it does in the body. It's MAP kinase, and this is an oversimplification. Okay, so if I'm developing drugs using this model, but my body's working using this model, I've got a problem, okay? And when you pluck one thing out of that entire cascade and change what it does, now you understand why every drug on the market has a list of side effects this long. Okay, animal experimentation is also often used in pharmaceutical development. No, the rat is not praying. Um, okay, he's just uh, eating something. Um, but evolution would tell us that since we all have a common ancestor, we can learn a lot of things about human bodies by studying animal models. In a certain sense, this is a little bit true because we do have a common designer and we're all built on a common plan, right? But if evolution were true, you look at the genome, the, the, the genetic sequence in all these organisms, they'd be so similar that if I mutate something in a mouse, I should be able to determine what's going on in a man from that mutation. Now, TGF-alpha is a gene that causes cancer when it's mutated in human beings. So they wanted a cancer model in mice, so they mutated the TGF-alpha. And do you know what happened? The mouse had curly hair. <laughs> the mouse did not have cancer, the mouse had curly hair. Okay? There is a limit to how much animal experimentation can show us about pharmaceutical products. And any of you know this if you have a dog and you make sure not to get your dog any grapes or chocolate, right? What is toxic to an animal is not necessarily toxic to a man. And what is not toxic to an animal might be toxic to a man. Deer can eat poison ivy. I shouldn't do that. <laughs> All right, the last thing I'm going to talk about with the medical paradigm is, is abortion. And I'm going to develop this a little bit more in my next talk, which is about evolution and the anti-culture of death. And I believe it was Brother Columbus spoke a little bit about the idea that, that um, embryonic recapitulation of the evolutionary sequence, so that the idea that the embryo would go through a fish stage and then an amphibian stage and then a reptile stage and then a mammal stage and eventually a human stage was actually one of the original intellectual justifications for abortion. Oh, it's just a lump of tissue. It's not a human yet. How many times have we heard that? Right? Um, these are the drawings that Heckel used. Um, if you look at the, the, the top row, um, we've got a fish, a salamander, a tortoise, a chicken, a pig, a cow, a rabbit, and a human. And they all look very similar. Um, Heckel said this was the first stage of embryological development. It's actually not. The first stage of embryological development is when you go from one cell to two cells. And you would think that going from one cell to two cells is a very uncomplicated process. Maybe everybody would do it the same way. Nope. Some cell division takes place on this plane, so you get a top cell and a bottom cell. Some takes place on this plane, so you get a front cell or a side cell and a side cell. Some takes place on this plane, so you get a front cell and a back cell. The way that these cells are oriented in the mother's womb actually determines what they eventually will become in the body. Right? That's important. You would think that the cells would divide evenly. They don't. Sometimes they do. Sometimes you've got a big cell on one side and a tiny cell on the other side, or a big cell on top and a tiny cell on the bottom, or a tiny cell on top and a big cell on the bottom. 
This is one cell division, guys. If we all came from a common ancestor, why is everybody doing it differently? Right? So he, he takes these embryos, he says, so since they're all so similar, we all have the similar development. This is great proof for evolution. You might suspect, if you look at the bottom right at the human embryo, that Heckel is maybe not the best artist in the world. Because I've never seen a baby that looks quite like that. Okay? And it turns out that Heckel's not only not the best artist in the world, he's a massive fraud. Because when you look at actual photos of the embryos at the stages of development that Heckel was trying to draw them at, they look nothing like each other and nothing like what he drew. So this is not the world's best proof for evolution theory. And unfortunately, it's led to a lot of really negative consequences, which again, I'll talk a little bit more about in my next talk. So in summary, we've seen how evolution is basically overturned by the simplest scientific research. We've seen how evolution impedes even the simplest scientific research. And we've also seen how evolutionary ideas negatively impact human activities, particularly in medicine. So let's go back to our definition of natural science. Science is the intellectual and practical activity encompassing the systematic study of the structure and behavior of the physical and natural world through observation and experiment. Is evolution science? No. Evolution is an atheistic pseudo-religion masquerading as a scientific explanation for our first origins and our final end. Thank you. Thank <clears throat> you.